Okay, thank you everyone for being here and good afternoon from our side. Today, uh, I'm your host, Francesca La Rosa, and uh, uh, we're going to have Ali Carrazzi as a speaker, who is a Marie Curie Fellow at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change and Kafuska University in Venice. He will be talking about network resilience in human environmental systems. Just a bit for introduction about how we're a webinar series and CMCC. Uh, CMCC is a research center dedicated to the study and investigation of our climate system and its interaction with society to provide reliable, rigorous and timely scientific results. We are very active also in providing insights and policy recommendations for adaptation and mitigation to climate change. CMCC is organized in the form of a network uh, distributed across the whole country, Italy. And we have offices in Venice, Bologna, Milano, uh, Viterbo, Caserta, Lecce and Sassari. Uh, I'm presently uh, based in the Venice uh, office, but uh, many, many colleagues are actually distributed throughout the country, as I was saying. And we are also spanning across different research divisions and uh, research lines from advanced scientific computing to economic analysis of impacts, ocean predictions, sustainable earth modeling, regional modeling and risk assessment. This, of course, uh, leads me to the variety of topics that uh, the Research Center is covering, from the modeling of our future Earth to the understanding of oceans and cities up to inequalities and global policies. Uh, very briefly, a few words about the outreach activities, um, as we strongly believe that research should be communicated outside the research community. We're very active in providing communication in the form of publication events, such as these webinars and in education forums. Now, some housekeeping rules about this session. Uh, we're going to have our speaker introducing the topic and then a Q&A session. How to interact with the speaker and with the audience. Uh, your audio and video are automatically deactivated now by default, so you can use the raise hand feature uh, if you want to speak, so pose the question directly to the speaker, or instead you can write your question in the Q&A section and I will take care of uh, saying it out loud. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded on the CMCC YouTube channel, so you will have the chance to again watch it again or share it with colleagues and fellow researchers and, and uh, policymakers. But if you have any further question, please do not hesitate to send an email to webinar at cmcc.it. In two days of advertising, we have another webinar on data learning, integrating data simulation and machine learning. Um, the registration is now open and I now will leave the floor to Ali. Uh, you can unmute yourself uh, and, um, and share your screen whenever you're ready. Thanks. All right. Let me share the screen. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Karazi. I'm at the Euro Mediterranean Center for Climate Change at Kafoscari University of Venice. Uh, so today I would like to discuss with you on uh, what can the topology of networks tell us about the resilience of our coupled social environmental systems. Uh, for today's presentation, first I will give you a uh, general overview of the concept of resilience and specifically the, the ecological network approach. Next, uh, we will be going over a few applications of the ENA approach in coupled social environmental systems. Uh, these include some of my uh, past research. Um, and finally, I would like to discuss with you my recent research examining the network resilience of phosphor cycling in China. <clears throat> so the concept of resilience um, is something we quite often come across, and it is increasingly being used in sustainable development, disaster management, and environmental uh, sciences. Um, it is also quite often uh, cited 
among the SDGs. We see that it is directly used in SDG 9 and SDG 11. And if you actually look at under the hood of the SDGs, looking to get the targets and indicators, you come across this concept of resilience quite often. From an academic perspective, uh, the, uh, the literature surrounding the concept of resilience has uh, developed independently in discrete fields. Uh, in the engineering field, they have a very particular notion of resilience. Uh, in the social psychological literature, resilience also is discussed in depth. And um, also, the ecological environmental sciences discuss resilience. And my research is mostly based on this, uh, this direction found in the ecological environmental uh, field. Particularly, I, I use the ecological network approach in examining a variety of different uh, social environmental uh, systems. You can use an ENA approach for uh, examining food webs, ecological networks. You can examine river and hydrological networks. You can even look at various urban networks, for example, in waste, in energy, in transportation. And a lot of work I've done personally, I've looked at a lot of uh, economic trade networks, specifically commodity trade. And uh, now, uh, particularly with my Mercury uh, Fellowship, we're looking at food trade under climate change. So what is the ecological information-based approach? Um, in this approach, we discuss that resiliency results from a balance between redundancy and efficiency. What is redundancy? What is efficiency? Well, efficiency is basically the degree of articulation or constraints in a network. It is not economic efficiency. It's a little bit different from that. And I quite often get in trouble with a lot of economists in the room. Um, efficiency, we're talking about network efficiency. Uh, redundancy reflects the degree of network freedom. So on one hand, you have efficiency and on another hand, you have redundancy. These are quite opposing sort of or balancing indicators in many ways. And I, I, I would try to explain this in the, um, uh, in the next slide. So you have a more visual understanding of what we're uh, discussing here. So look at these two uh, very conceptually, obviously conceptual uh, figures. And the top figure, you see that uh, we have uh, seven compartments. All compartments are connected to each other. So you have maximum redundancy. And using that formula, uh, we have a figure for redundancy standing at 3.89 bits. These are units of uh, informational bits. Um, and efficiency in the top figure is zero. In the bottom figure, we have a higher efficiency. Um, every compartment is connected to its neighboring compartment. And therefore, compared to the uh, top figure, we see the efficiency uh, going up to 1.94 bits. So these are the two opposing sort of uh, uh, network topologies we see here in this, uh, in this slide. Now, you can use the ENA approach um, to examine food webs. And this is the earliest works they've, they've actually applied this approach to, looking at food webs. And uh, food webs is basically a picture of who eats who in the animal kingdom. And you see here, again, these two figures are very conceptual. But you see in the top figure, you see uh, prawns, large fish, and alligators. And you see there's very little redundancy and therefore resilience is zero. Uh, if I remove the large fish node or if uh, less prawns are consumed by the large fish, then the alligators will be in trouble. So because of this, resiliency is almost zero in my system. Um, however, in the bottom figure, you see a bit of redundancy. If there is no large fish, then the alligators can consume the turtles or the snakes and vice versa. So this gives the system a little bit of resilience. And it's fascinating to see that in the natural world, uh, many studies have been conducted so far. A lot of ecosystems, a lot of uh, natural uh, networks lie in this window of vitality we see here on the top uh, portion of this uh, figure in that they have an optimal balance between um, being 
uh, not being too efficient and not being not having too much diversity. If you have too much efficiency, obviously your system is very brittle, so you're prone to shocks and prone to disruptions. And the other hand, if you have too much diversity, you know, it's your, your system becomes stagnant. You have to spend a lot of energy and power in keeping these additional and extra redundancies and flows in your system. So ideally, what you want for higher uh, system resilience is to have a value that balances these two opposing uh, forces of redundancy versus efficiency. So um, we, we can use this ENA approach and apply it to various uh, coupled social environmental systems. And in the following slides, I would like to convey to you um, a few very short uh, examples of uh, how we've been using the DNA ENA approach um, in water and trade uh, systems uh, previously. So in the first example, I would like to bring your attention to the Hei Hei River Basin. The Hei Hei River Basin is the second largest inland river basin in China. It is of huge strategic uh, importance for China's uh, uh, food security and food needs. And it also uh, lies in a region which is uh, seeing a lot of uh, a lot of effects from ongoing uh, climate change in, 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 in China. So this river basin um, has three reaches. It has an upper reach, which is the mountains and the glaciers. This is the source of a lot of water. Uh, this water goes to the middle reaches. The middle reaches is the uh, focal point of a lot of anthropocentric activities, specifically farming. And the lower reaches um, host the terminal end, uh, end point or end lake of the uh, river basin. And it, there's not a lot of agriculture going on. They do have uh, a little bit of uh, uh, grazing and animal grazing, however, in the lower reaches of, of uh, the river basin. The total area of this river basin is about uh, 130,000 kilometers. So using approaches from hydrology, we managed to uh, map the water flows uh, in this river basin across eight compartments. You see compartment one, two, three, and eight. These are hydrological compartments and compartment four, five, six, seven represent the anthropocentric activities, uh, specifically agricultural industry and household usages of water. Um, and by mapping out uh, the flows of this river basin over a 10 year period, we uh, noticed some very interesting uh, trends. Specifically, uh, as the story goes in uh, with uh, the Hei Hei River Basin is that because of uh, recent increases of farming, uh, uh, the people in that region, they were facing water shortages. And the regional government actually decided to invest towards modernization of their canals. Basically, they poured a lot of concrete uh, over these dirt canals, and they increased the efficiency of the water flow of, uh, in, in uh, this river basin. Water flow from uh, the, uh, the river and the mountain regions to the middle reaches where they were having agricultural and other anthropocentric activities. Now, what we revealed in our study is that although water saving policies were very successful and we saw increases of efficiency gradually throughout this 10 year period. However, we also saw a decrease in the resilience of the system. Most notably, uh, the groundwater compartments, where you see here the, the third compartment, uh, we noticed that uh, it is being uh, receiving less and less water throughout the years. And at the same time, we also noticed that the resiliency of the system is also decreasing. So even though water saving policies were very successful uh, in that these concrete canals were delivering water uh, more efficiently to the farmers, however, the water was not seeping back 
to the ground. And uh, therefore, water saving policies came with a trade off of decreasing levels of resilience in the system. And this was an important finding for us. The other area where we have been applying the ENA approach has been um, in, in examining trade networks. Specifically, in this study, we looked at uh, trade networks, uh, the global trade networks, specifically in their reaction to the 2009 uh, financial shock. Uh, now, um, I'm really curious how the pandemic of 2020 actually had an effect on our global trade network. So that's a, that's a fascinating uh, future uh, research avenue. The data is not out there yet. I think maybe in one year or two years, we, we should be gradually getting trade data from 2020. So it'd be really interesting to repeat this uh, study uh, using 2020 uh, data. Um, what we found using the ENA approach in examining global trade and uh, the effects of the 2009 shock on global trade was the following. Um, we saw a direct link between the topology of the economic sector and how much it lost uh, due to the uh, shock. If a particular sector had higher levels of efficiency, then that sector uh, had higher losses during this economic shock. And consecutively, uh, sectors with higher efficiency actually had a hard, harder time uh, growing back following in 2010 after the shock. So economic shocks really impacted networks, uh, economic sectors uh, differently based on their configurations. And the higher efficiency the economic sector had, the more, uh, the less resiliency they had uh, in terms of their growth. This was also a very, very interesting a finding we had when examining uh, trade networks using the ENA approach. And in our latest research, we have been examining the network resilience of phosphorus cycling in China. Uh, between the years 1600 and 2012. Now, as you know, phosphorus is uh, critical for food security and approximately 90% of global phosphate rock demand is only for food production. Um, and because of population growth, because of limited recycling and finite resources of the rock, and really phosphorus intensive diets, we are increasingly putting a lot of pressure on the global access and availability of phosphorus. And many researchers actually discuss uh, peak phosphorus as being uh, another inconvenient truth for our collective food security. This is especially uh, uh, so in China um, where the uh, network resilience of phosphorus cycling. Here we define that as the continuous access of phosphorus within the network becomes more and more vulnerable to various social environmental shocks and disturbances. And while a lot of researchers talk about the availability uh, of, of phosphorus based mostly from an accounting perspective, uh, i.e., you know, how much phosphorus rock do we have? How much can we use this phosphorus? Are we, are we closer to peak phosphorus? What we're really not um, looking at and not considering are the opportunities and costs from an indirect network effect uh, reflecting the metabolic flow network of phosphorus. So by examining phosphorus to a network approach, uh, we can actually have a better long-term um, holistic governance of phosphorus. And also we can better detect and perhaps better uh, nudge our societies to, um, to maintain uh, more sustainable phosphorus cycling patterns. 
and fire, phosphorus recycling patterns in society is, is highly important. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later in, in the following slides. So, so the data we looked at was uh, phosphorus cycling in China between 1600 and 2012. A lot of, um, um, and during this period, the population of China, as you might all know, uh, approximately grew tenfold and phosphorus supplies were also uh, increased by approximately 13 fold. And although China has the second largest uh, phosphorus mine resources in the world, uh, because of the excessive demand of phosphorus, uh, China will surely face uh, phosphorus scarcity in the next three generations, about 50 to 100 years. And to examine the phosphorus metabolism flow network in China, what we did, we constructed a 149 node network for every year from 1600 to 2012 using the principles of mass balance. Uh, you know, the, these 149 nodes, they included 43 sectors, 136 products from uh, natural sort of flows of phosphorus to industrial usages in farming and industry and whatnot. Um, every flow of phosphorus was uh, somewhat considered in uh, our network. And we applied the ecological network analysis to look at not only the evolution of the topology of, of the phosphorus uh, cycling network throughout these years, but we also looked at the underlying determinants of, of, uh, the, of this network. So this is a visual representation of the phosphorus cycling network uh, in China. Specifically, this image reflects 2012. As you see, there's many nodes, and here we consider um, a, the, uh, the, the size of the flows between two nodes uh, are reflected in the thickness of the line. And in the other image, we see various uh, natural and industrial flows and in anthropocentric flows of phosphorus um, in, in our system. These are our results um, examining the uh, resilience of phosphorus uh, cycle flows in China uh, from 1600 to 2012. We see that the evolution of the resilience of this network can be generally divided into three stages. And the first stage is uh, the year 1600 to 1911. Then we see another stage, 1911 to 1950. And the final modern stage, which we can consider ourselves to be in, is 1950, 2012. Um, in the first and second stages of this evolution, we see that uh, there was no chemical pea fertilizer used in China. Um, so that's why the resilience of it was kind of very stable and it reflected um, natural flows uh, of phosphorus in the system. In the second stage of um, this evolution, we see that the value of resilience uh, has a lot of volatility. And this basically reflects the social political turmoil and wars China was facing at that era. Uh, a lot of wars happened at that era, which led to uh, bad governance in the agricultural sector, a lot of famine, and therefore, we see this volatility in the resilience of the phosphorus flow network. In the third stage, we see that China begins to increasingly rely on chemical uh, phosphorus fertilizers in its agricultural, for its agricultural needs. And the increasing dependence on chemical pea fertilizers uh, subsequently decreased the resilience of the network by about 18 to 20%. And surely the future, you know, if in the future we continue this declining trend, uh, we see this would indicate that our network would be increasingly vulnerable to not only random, but also targeted socioeconomic shocks. This would mean that the access to phosphorus flows uh, may be disrupted. And if phosphorus has shortages, uh, this would 
put not only the sustainability, but also the security of China's food and agricultural system at risk. So what are the social economic factors of phosphorus cycling in China? Well, on the demand side, we can look at human phosphorus demand. We can also identify food structure, uh, which technically food structure is the sum of, of uh, all phosphorus content in all foods, except for grain, divided by the phosphorus content in grain. It is also, we can look at urbanization ratio. As you know, urbanization uh, also leads to a more uh, complex uh, food diets and therefore more uh, phosphorus. Um, from the supply side, we can identify fertilizer phosphorus use proportion. And technically speaking, this is indicated by the amount of uh, chemical fertilizer uh, used in arable land divided by the total amount of uh, phosphorus used in arable land. Also, P recycling rate, that is also a uh, supply side factor. And it's basically the proportion of renewable phosphorus, uh, for example, coming from human and animal excreta. Um, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to investigate how these socioeconomic factors may affect the network resilience. And therefore we propose the hypothesis on the mechanisms of how resilience in this network changes. Uh, the hypothesis is as follows. So uh, the resilience of the peace cycling network is influenced by human food demand, both scale and structure, through structural changes, for example, in pea fertilizer proportion of the network. And to test this hypothesis, we conducted a correlation analysis among the uh, many socioeconomic factors. We eliminated covariant effects, obviously, and we selected the relevant indicators for a regression model. And we did, did this regression, uh, multilinear regression over uh, different time periods to evaluate this hypothesis. What we end up uh, in our findings was the following. We found that during the 1950 to 2012, uh, the resilience of phosphorus cycling uh, network in China was negatively correlated with human phosphorus demand or basically fertilizer phosphorus use proportion and food structure. And the story basically is very simple. Uh, because China was having a massive increase, massive growth of uh, population and food demand, the phosphorus cycling network had to change its structure to find more efficient pathways, which had higher intensities and specializations in, uh, in the phosphorus flow. We're talking here about industrial phosphorus production. We're talking here about uh, fertilizer uh, phosphorus use. And during 2000, 2012, uh, the main determinants were uh, by urbanization and dietary changes. Um, so towards the later, the closer we get to the present, we see that the network resilience was more and more determined by how many people are in cities and what they are eating. This is because people moving to cities, uh, their diets changes from a vegetarian, vegetarian uh, based diet to more complex, uh, usually meat based diets, which requires a lot of grain and a lot of phosphorus. Um, um, to raise uh, that meat. And also, once you start moving in the, in the city, uh, your, the proportion of recycled uh, phosphorus food, food production also decreases. In rural areas, it's very easy to use animal and human excreta uh, and recycle that phosphorus. But in cities, this is not really practical. So all of these trends really change the network structure. Uh, for example, we're talking here about increasing fertilizer phosphorus use proportion and the decreasing uh, phosphorus recycling rate. And the flow diversity 
of uh, the cycling network decrease and consecutively we see a decrease in the resilience of the phosphor cycling network in China. When we look at the effects of changes in individual links, we see that under um, traditionally under an agrarian society, we see that network resilience was mainly a result of changes arising from natural phosphorus flows. We're talking here about the natural pathway of phosphorus from soil uh, used for food production. In the modern era, however, network resilience is uh, quite often dominated by phosphorus flows from stock, that's phosphorus rocks, to non-arable land. So we're talking about here mining and the production of chemical fertilizers. And really, when you look at the trend and overall long-term picture, we see that network resilience has shifted from being driven by natural flows without fertilizer to industrial phosphorus flows. Especially during 2000-2012, the uh, network resilience was dominated by the following pathway of stock uh, to P rocks from mining to fertilizers. Uh, when we look at the changes in individual nodes, we can also see that from the viewpoint of phosphorus outflows from nodes, specifically looking at phosphorus supply perspective, uh, we see that the network resilience has is mainly due to nodes located in the upstream stages of the food supply chain. Here we're talking about cultivation and maize, beans and rice. We're talking about animal husbandry, mining. Uh, we're talking about the phosphorus rock stock themselves. Um, but what is not happening, unfortunately, is that the nodes located in the downstream stages of the food chain, waste water treatment, solid waste disposal, play a minimal role in changes to network resilience. And this is fundamentally because uh, in China, as is the case throughout most uh, uh, industrialized uh, nations, there are a, an insufficient uh, diffusion of phosphorus recovering technologies. Uh, therefore, we see a lot of these downstream nodes and not well connected with the upstream stages of the food supply chains. So having this general picture and general understanding of the uh, uh, phosphorus cycling network in China. How can we, how can we improve the resilience? Um, well, frankly speaking, the current phosphorus cycling network is a one-way journey. Uh, most of the phosphorus is just deposited in the soil or it's just discharged in water bodies or solid waste. Um, and most of this uh, ends up uh, if it's from the water bodies, you have an issue of eutrophication of water bodies as well. And to really satisfy the increasing uh, demand for food and to guarantee sustainable development and a safe and secure food security, we should not really only rely on phosphorus rocks. And we should fundamentally improve the resilience of the phosphorus recovery and reuse from the downstream nodes to the upstream nodes of the food supply chains. So these are our policy, these are the policy suggestions we uh, make um, in, in our paper. Um, first and foremost, we suggest the reduction of food loss and food waste. Um, currently, um, households in China consume about 1.8 million tons of phosphorus uh, in their food. If food loss and waste can be completely avoided, I know it's a tall order, but assuming it can be completely avoided, uh, then household phosphorus consumption will be only 1.2 uh, met, uh, metric tons of phosphorus. And this will bump up the uh, resilience of the phosphorus cycling network in China by up to 9.3%. The other thing we can do is improve farm to fork efficiency, that is uh, productivity of phosphorus. And evidently, the concentration uh, degree of phosphorus flows is one of the primary structural factors influencing network resilience. So potential improvements in this avenue lie in fertilizer production, crop production, food processing, food consumption, and composting. 
So basically we want to get more productivity at, uh, from using our phosphorus sources. The next thing we really wanna get into is reducing fertilizer use. As you know, phosphorus mineral fertilizer relative to the total amount of phosphorus used in an arable land has increased from 0.2% in 1950 to 76% in 2012. And this has brought down our network. Uh, um, and if this ratio is reduced to the global average in China, the global average being 54%, this would increase the a resi network resilience of phosphorus flows in China by about 8.1%. And, you know, this is not so difficult to achieve and it could be easily achieved through more organic farming and uh, precision agriculture. Precision agriculture is a fascinating area. There's a lot of new companies getting into this specifically in China. So reducing our fertilizer use is, is, uh, can be uh, achievable in the distant future. Last but not least, increasing P recycling rate. So the current recycling of phosphorus in China mostly comes from animal and human excreta in rural areas. Um, other measures uh, which would increase the phosphorus recycling rate would include uh, plowing crop residues back into the soil. This is a, this is a, a, a method from uh, farming. Uh, other things we can do is composting food waste and uh, recovering phosphorus from sewage sludge, steel making slags, uh, that's the industrial use of phosphorus, and wastewater, especially, especially in the downstream stages of the food supply chains. Now, it's very interesting. Last time I was in China, actually, I saw these uh, very small carts uh, moving around the city in Shanghai and collecting food waste from restaurants. And I actually talked to one of the, uh, the people uh, driving these vehicles. And I later learned that this is a uh, new governmental program where they take food waste from uh, various restaurants and they uh, try to recycle it, get compost out of it. And in fact, they are, it's increasing P uh, the pea recycling rate. So there are a lot of interesting activities and programs being right now um, uh, implemented in, uh, by, uh, in China. And uh, this is reflecting the critical nature of phosphorus for uh, China's uh, future food security and sustainable development. Last but not least, um, um, in a recent paper, I have argued that resilience should be viewed as a public good. And a lot of discussions we, we have when we look at these various social uh, environmental networks is that the system's level property of resilience is determined collectively by individual agency contributions as a public good. Once we consider resilience as a public good, we can actually argue that resilience is in undersupply. So what is a public good? I, I should have started with this first, actually. A public good basically is non-rival. That means that once it's provided, uh, others can consume it at no additional cost. It is also non-excludable. That means once it's provided, it, uh, it's impossible or highly expensive to prevent anyone from consuming and it has positive externalities. So in my opinion, uh, we should view resilience as a public good, and we should um, encourage more, uh, a wider uh, public policy debate and discussion on how to uh, promote resilience in our various uh, social and environmental uh, networks. Uh, that that's uh, that ends our uh, the presentation. Um, thank you very much for uh, bearing with me. Um, I would love to hear your questions and comments, and I hope we continue the discussion um, uh, further. 
Thank you, thank you, Ali. Very interesting. We actually have some questions already, so I will start in order with the first ones. Two are very much uh, dedicated to phosphorus, so the, the final um, the final study that you actually explained. The first is from Leon Capetas, who is asking, I'm familiar with resilience and sustainability definition and the way of the difference between the two, but I would like to know what is the difference between the two terms in the context of phosphorus cycling. While the second one is from Carla schulte fischedick uh, who is asking which kind of phosphorus cycling are existing in Europe and how would they, could they be increased? Mm -hmm. I will then move to the later questions. Uh, you first address these two questions and then I will pass to the others, if you don't mind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, both, both terms, they touch upon this um, quite a lot of, uh, they have quite a lot of overlap um, when we are examining uh, phosphorus cycling. Uh, but I think resilience is uh, looking at, uh, it's more about shocks. So um, coming back stronger, uh, uh, having that reflexibility, um, while sustainability is more broader in its scope and definition. Um, so there will be the two uh, distinguishing futures I would see um, when we're examining peace cycling. However, you're absolutely right. They do have some overlap. And they're, um, um, yeah. With uh, what kind of phosphorus cycling exists in Europe? Um, well, there's a lot of, uh, I, I'm not an expert on this uh, issue, to be honest. But I've, I, from a, um, personally, I've seen a lot of uh, composting um, in, 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 in European cities uh, by the general public. And I also know that um, there are various industrial scale um, um, <clears throat> plants where they take wastewater and from that wastewater, they try to um, um, take the phosphorus out and resupply it to the agricultural sector. Um, how they can be increased? Well, I think um, similar uh, programs that are being piloted around the world is just to um, compost our food waste and food loss. I think it has one of the greatest potentials would be in that area. But again, I'm not an expert about phosphorus flows in, uh, in, in Europe, but I think these would be quite relevant um, to, to the European case as well. Well, thank you. Let's try to uh, give a bit of context. You mentioned already, for example, the composting in the European case. Here we have a question from Brian who is asking, how is the food waste collection in Shanghai funded? So is there a private enterprise, for example, that could profit from composting food waste and distributing that nitrogen phosphorus back to the rural areas for food production? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, as far as I know, I think it was a uh, citywide effort um, of the Shanghai government. Um, at what level of that government, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, but there is definitely, uh, uh, there could be money made for the private enterprise in this. And I think um, as the generation of electricity becomes cheaper, a lot of the farming can actually be done uh, in cities. So now we have urban farming. Um, we have uh, a lot of new technology uh, where uh, the phosphorus is recycled. It is not released to the uh, outside to the waters or to the soil. I think they're called. Uh, they they are these uh, container ships. They they take old container ships and they put uh, um, hy hydroponics, for example. Uh, so a lot of a lot of new technology that could enable us to. Um, recycle our phosphorus uh, within the city and and uh, grow our food in the city as well. Um, yeah, so there is definitely economic uh, aspects in that. Uh, and once it becomes profitable, I think companies can take advantage of it and rely less on, on the role of government. Yeah, so that could be a very interesting future indeed. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. We have another question from Robbie, uh, who is asking, you mentioned efficiency and resilience as network features. Are there lower level structural metrics that describe these graphs? Is there a relationship between these and your more notable emergent properties? I'm also personally curious about, for example, modularity in networks. And if you look at modularity in the studies that you, that you presented to us today. Uh, lower level structural metrics. Um, yeah, so you can actually measure the relationship uh, from two nodes. So that's called pointwise mutual information. You can see how two nodes, um, how, for the lack of words here, I want to see how, what is the attraction level of these two nodes? Or what, are the, what is the... Um, um, yeah, so you can, you can look at metrics between two nodes. What is the strength of the relationship between two nodes? So that would be a, a, a lower level structural metric. Uh, with modularity, modularity is, uh, it, it is amazing actually, modularity as well. Um, I have not uh, used modularity in my studies so much. Um, I am trying to uh, get into uh, that metric more and more. And I think looking at uh, modularity and comparing it with uh, efficiency and redundancy and looking at the trade-offs between modularity and the other network futures, this is a very exciting uh, research avenue. And I, I don't think anyone's got into that yet. Uh, but modularity is a little bit tricky because it's, it's all about how you divide the pie. Uh, so how do you, how do you look you know, you, you have a system, but then how do you, where do you make the cutoff and how do you define your, your tribes and how do you measure the relationship between the various segments of that system? That, that has a little bit to do with art. So how do you, how do you make this division? It, it's a little bit tricky. So um, I have not unfortunately uh, done much work in modularity, but that's something I really want to get into uh, for future research. Yeah. Um, yeah, did I answer Thank Robbie you. well we enough? Have... I mean, they can come back with follow-up questions if uh, I'm not so Yeah, clear, Robbie, but... if, you're still, if you're still here, yeah. uh, uh, you can comment if you, if you want. Uh, I see that it's still connected. Um, there is another, yeah, he says that uh, that's great. So I think he's satisfied. Uh, there's another question from Emanuele Zoller. Sorry if I misspell names, guys. I hope that I'm doing uh, the best job. Um, how can the resilience principle be valued in the legal framework? Uh, that's, a, that's a fascinating uh, question. I met one, one researcher actually who looked at the, um, so what he did, uh, he, he took all the legal texts on uh, environmental agreements in the world because these, these legal texts, if you look at the top portion of the legal agreements, like international legal agreements, they all cite other legal agreements. So you can end up making a network of, of legal agreements. Um, but the problem with that is that uh, you can't use the ENA approach because well, I guess you could in a way because it, 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 you can look at the strength. So how many times they cite each other. Uh, so it's a little bit tricky, but uh, you, you could um, examine the resilience of, of uh, legal frameworks in the sense that how many times they cite each other and you, you can make a network out of it. But um, in terms of practicality, how much does that make sense? Um, that's something which uh, I think we should have a further discussion about it, yeah. It's a bit what's happening, for example, in bibliometric framework, in bibliometric network, I guess, yes. You're, you're basically yeah. measuring how many times and how strong are these co-citations and interactions. We have another question from Marcello Arosio. Uh, he's asking, did you consider to investigate about network percolation analysis? Uh, no, I have not. Um, I have not examined uh, uh, network percolation uh, analysis, yeah. But that was something would be interesting to do, I think, yeah. 
Okay, hopefully you can you can get in touch after this after this webinar and uh, see if there are potentials. Um, the final question is um, related to the to the first study that you showed. Um, um, you were talking about free uh, reaches, I believe, so free layers basically. Uh, did you check the relationship between different components within each? reach or did you just analyze the relationship from different compartments across different reaches? Ah, I see. Um, yeah, the, the three reaches, I mean, so the first reach uh, with the sort of the environmental inputs where the yeah. water started and the middle reach uh, had the more the, uh, the anthropocentric components. And the final reach was was the uh, the last compartment. Um, that's how we divided it. Um, but uh, no, we, we did not look at the individual sort of reaches and build a network at the individual level of reach. No, we did not do that. Yeah, we took a, like a more holistic um, uh, flow from the, the top. So from the mountains, the water melts. It goes, it goes, it, it, the agriculture sector uses it, and then the leftovers go to the terminal lake and the groundwater. So that's how we mapped it out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we didn't look at the individual reaches. Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, if there's no further question, which at the moment I don't see, the, feel free to raise your hand if you want to interact uh, directly. So by asking your question uh, using your voice. Otherwise, uh, feel free to contact the author, which is Ali, or uh, webinar at cmcc.it uh, for further for any further question that you may have. Um, okay, no, we have different questions. Sorry. So I'll I'll try to ask you the final one. So Steve Walbridge is asking: Modularity sounds interesting. None of the conclusions of the Foster study needed the network analysis to arrive at. So uh, maybe network is a bit redundant in this case. Um, that involves, uh, says, for example, for example, reuse, recycle, avoid, etc., are all wisdom. So the art part is specifying how, what is best, and for economics, who does it. That involves expanding the network boundaries, including new nodes like legal instruments and so changing the structure that you're making resilience. It becomes a new network. Uh, I'm not sure, Steve, if you wanna, if you wanna interact with us uh, live, if you wanna explain a bit uh, what you mean, uh, but uh, Ali, if you, yeah, Steve, so I let you talking. I think you can now ask your question directly. You're muted. Yeah. I didn't realize I could do it myself. Um, yes. Sorry, that was a really confused question. But um, what I was trying to get to was when, when, you, when you define your initial network, you've, you've got a problem and you've drawn your boundary, you've, you've touched on it in some of the other answers. You then you examine the structure of this network and you say what the solutions could be then impose some of the solutions on those things. So with the, say the answers to your, your phosphorus network where you say you need to cycle things in different directions. Do you do any of the, the modeling of that? Do you, do you look at your network again when you, you look at the new network that would appear as a result of some of these solutions going? Because if that, that changes the thing you're defining resilience as the resilience of your but then if you bring who are doing different things and some of the new solutions, then you're changing, the th making resilient. You may, you can find other solutions to the phosphorus problem that aren't phosphorus, for example, making that one up, but <laughs> you, may, you may have a different kind of mineral that you could use to do a similar job. Apply for a phosphorus network, but the, the problem becomes a big one when you start to bring in the solutions these metrics and how your, your network analyses work when you start to add in answers. <clears throat> I 
probably not made it any clearer at all, have I? No, sorry. It's because no, I so, I, so you're referring to uh, like, um, so I, I think from what I understand is, is that your question is about boundaries, right? Yeah. But I, I need to look at networks for, for sustainability. So if I take an example that I'm more familiar how you would decommission a building sustainably. So we set I mean, boundaries is, is, is uh, yeah, the more, uh, the more we can increase the width of, of the, uh, you know, the boundary of, of what we're looking at. I mean, the, the more successful we can become in implementing any, any policies, sustainable policies. So you're, you're definitely correct in that. Uh, but uh, it's very difficult to, uh, I mean, so these network approaches in general, you need to have a common denominator in the flows. So if you're looking at one element and if you add another element, you somehow have to combine the two elements into a common denominator. And quite often what happens in, in, um, in a lot of these approaches, people make the common de the denominator into a currency unit yeah. and it loses all, uh, you know, it, it can be criticized. Uh, doesn't make sense. Why do we need to, why can't, how, you know, uh, if you denominate everything into a dollar euro value, it loses the essence. So I totally agree with you. The, the, the more wider boundary we have in, in our analysis, the, the more practical we can get it. But it's also very difficult to, to realize a, a wider boundary. Uh, okay. is, there, is there any prospect for when you're doing that? You, you set up, say, this phosphorus network. So you've got the flow of phosphorus in this one, but then you have an adjacent network which has a different flow, but they have common nodes where define some sort of interaction rules at different places is that yeah it happens uh so the other thing you can do is for example if you have uh if you're looking at water uh water let's say in food uh or, i mean let me rephrase it so you can perhaps use embodied water let's say of products or you can look at embodied energy or embodied uh, carbon so even you have the same compartments but you have, uh, you have uh, flows of water and flows of energy, and you can just translate everything into water or translate everything into energy. And then you have a bigger network. But um, a lot of times when you construct these networks and you add more flows and you sort of uh, make them into common denominators, um, it becomes a little bit tricky as well because you, uh, you, you lose what you're trying to reflect. So it's, it's one of the limitations, I guess, of, of the method and, and, and um, of the scientific approach in general. But you're absolutely right yeah. to implement things. We, we do need a wider uh, boundary uh, in our systems, yeah. Okay. So guys, I'm gonna stop you there because uh, I, have, I have another question, which is the final one. So Laura or Laura, uh, you got the final question for our speaker. In your definition of resilience as a public good, which is basically your last slide. Do you differentiate between quality, access, and quantity of resources? For example, water. Do you think this would change the public the public policy approach to resource management? Um, quality, access, and quantity of resources. Ah, I see. <clears throat> yeah, that that is. Uh, so I think uh, as so it, it, it should, they should consider access issues and quality issues as well. Yeah. But as, as all things in economics, they, they tend to um, uh, simplify things. So I think when we say public good, uh, they don't directly uh, reflect quality issues of quality and issues of access. They assume that it's the same quality. It's the same, uh, everyone has the same access, um, but you're absolutely right. I think in in um, in real terms, from a public policy perspective, these issues also need to be um, uh, reflected. I can't see the question anymore, so we're, we're, so I was going to say something else, but uh, let me see. In your definition of resilience as a public good, do you differentiate between quality ah, I see it now, and quantity? Yeah. And then do you think this would change the public policy approach to resource management? This was the question. 
Yeah, for, so resource management, I think needs to, we need to have a discussion about resource management, especially we need to um, reconsider the issue of resilience in our resource management. And as far as I know, the World Research Council actually is considering re the resilience of various elements and various uh, resources uh, in their discussion. So I think this is, this is very important. Uh, so I think it should add to the discussion and hopefully uh, bring about positive change. Okay, and if we need to close, but I see that uh, also Robbie had a follow up. So, uh, are you active on Twitter? If you uh, I am are... active on Twitter. Uh, you can fabulous. follow me at. Uh, fabulous. I can I can send my. Does the chat work or? No, yeah. no, I'm I'm actually replying to Robbie. Uh, your account is Ari Karaji. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, I'm a great stalker on Twitter, so you can <laughs> tag you can tag everyone, and uh, so that we can continue the discussion live, or you can send your question to webinar at cmcc.it, and we will redirect uh, to the author. I thank everyone for uh, for uh, having stayed with us so late. I'm now sending. Uh, they reply on uh, the chat. Uh, so I guess that, uh, again, uh, if you want to continue this conversation live, you will. Um, but also, please get in touch so that we, can, that we can continue discussing. I thank you very much, all of you, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, please ask me any uh, questions or follow-ups uh, through Twitter. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.